2002 was an interesting, damn near fascinating year for WWF slash WWE history. It really was in a variety of different ways. You know, I could look back at this time period and say, as much as I hated 2001 because of its association with WCW and ECW going away, the stupidity of the invasion angle, man, 2002 was something else. You had all of this talent, all of this talent throughout the rosters. And yes, the rosters, because if you remember 2002, this is when they did the brand split. You were going to have Raw exclusive superstars and SmackDown exclusive superstars. And all the while you had the best for the most part of WWF and what they could offer. You had a lot of big names from WCW and the names from ECW in the fold, like Talent-wise, this is beyond question to me, the best period in WWF slash E history. Now, when you look at the talent roster at this time, it is unmatched from top to bottom. To me, it really, truly is. Uh, just incredible stuff. This is also the year that WWF got the F out and became World Wrestling Entertainment. As I've always quipped, you know, when they got the F out, the fun went with it. This is also the last year of the King of the Ring concept as its own standalone pay-per-view. It was replaced uh, in 2003 by, I believe it was Bad Blood. Am I right on that? I hope I'm right on that. If I'm wrong on that, who gives a crap? But all types of changes here. Um, this, was, this King of the Ring 2002 pay-per-view happened just a little bit after. Austin picked up his ball and he went home because he was pissed about some things and he was in a bad place. He wasn't feeling good. But most importantly, like, he didn't want a job out to Brock Lesnar in some random ass King of the Ring qualifying match on Raw when it was unadvertised and Austin was absolutely freaking lutely correct. Like, I cannot imagine to this day the stupidity of somebody, whoever it may have been, in the WWF at the time to say... Here's what we're going to do. We're going to take Brock Lesnar, who we're trying to smash over as the next big thing, and instead of building up to a big four pay-per-view or big pay-per-view type of payoff with a main event caliber opponent, like arguably the biggest star we've had in Stone Cold Steve Austin, we're going to give this dumb shit away at random for the hell all of it on Raw. And it's not even like a semi-final or final match. It's a qualifying match. Like, who does that? That's clown shit. And like, as much as you say, you know, the whole thing back then was, Austin, that's not how you conduct business, and you picked up your ball and you went home. Like, at the end of the day, like, looking back at it almost two decades later, could you fucking blame them in that case? Like, if a company is going to be so persistent in their stupidity that they would intentionally cost themselves millions of dollars, potentially, cost themselves a shit ton of pay-per-view buys when they could have had Austin versus Lesnar at freaking King of the Ring. Like, that's clown school shit right there, and I can't blame Austin for being pissed at the time. So it was all these types of things. And Rock, obviously, yeah, the mummy returns. Like, Rock's starting to be a little bit less of a player. Like, he's here at this time, but you, you know what I'm saying? Like, a lot of change and a lot of different things going on. And ironically enough, when you go back and look at this King of the Ring 2002 show, you could argue from top to bottom that this absolutely is the best King of the Ring card out of the 10. Show me a one that's better. They had better star power along with better quality of matches and booking decisions and so forth. I don't think there is one. Like the opener, Rob Van Dam and Chris Jericho in their King of the Ring semifinal match. Now, this was a really hell of high good opening match. King of the Ring semifinal match at that. Just ask 2002 Chris Jericho about it, because if you remember, this is one, you go back 19 years ago, this is one that apparently for some reason later that night, he got online and got all pissed about fans maybe questioning that this wasn't that great. And he's talking about like it's a four and a half star match and ah, da, 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 da. Should have been a bit of an insight to the insecurities that would come later in life when dealing with Chris Jericho, but... For this match here, it was really damn good. This is like peak physical prowess of Chris Jericho, peak physical talent of Rob Van Dam. You know, these two guys had pretty good chemistry together. So really, really, really good stuff there. 
And even the way they did it afterwards, like, Rob Van Dam wins, but Chris Jericho still attacks him afterwards. Like, it was freaking awesome. And I was surprised when I went back and watched this show, the other King of the Rings semifinal match, they gave Brock Lesnar and Test almost 10 minutes. Like, I, but for some reason, I was thinking, like, that it was Brock and Test, and Brock just smashed the piss out of him. But they didn't quite do that. Like, Test got in some stuff. Like, Test was a decent foe for him. And the match was somewhat decent. I don't know if you needed to have Paul Heyman interfere for a Brock Lesnar to beat a test, but nonetheless, they went there. But, you know, when you go back in time here, like this is the very formation of, this is Heyman the hype man. Here's Brock, the next big thing. And, like, it worked back then. But, you had a cruiserweight championship match. These guys were exclusive to SmackDown at the time, you remember. It was Jamie Noble taking on the Hurricane like the story between Nitty and the Hurricane, like the, the video package they show during the show does a good job of kind of bringing those memories back to light. Man, freaking hell, Jamie, Lynn and no Jamie Noble and Nitty were entertaining as hell. So was the Hurricane. Like the damn cruiserweights were kick-ass back then. Like I'm going to tell you something right now. Bold take my ass. You take 2002 Hurricane... 2002 Jamie Noble, and they could main event in today's wrestling business, and if you think they couldn't, you're clowns. In the hell they couldn't. Guaranteed Jamie Noble and Hurricane could do entertaining things more so than probably 90% of the rosters. A WWE, AEW, doesn't freaking matter. It's a good match. Really good match. And Noble wins and becomes a new Cruiserweight champion. Fucking match between Ric Flair and Eddie Guerrero was just classic. Like, two dirty players in the game, two cheaters, two cheap shot artists. Like, <laughs> going back and forth with them. Like, <laughs> I don't know why this match made me laugh. Like, was it, is it, like, absolute perfection from a visual standpoint? No. Is it one of those things where... I look at it and say, God damn, that's a lot of fun. Yes. I mean, even when the Invisible Man came out, like, that was a lot of fun to watch. It is important to remember, though, when you talk about this time period in WWE, because, again, they had gotten the F out. Um, you know, all the people that talk about Trish Stratus being the greatest diva of all time or greatest uh, female superstar in WWE history, certainly a very strong argument to make about that. But you also got to go back in time here in 2002, like even when it's her and Molly Holly wrestling for the women's championship, this was largely the piss break match. This is largely the fans don't care match. Can you imagine that now? Whereas you have the women's matches main eventing, you have the women's matches that oftentimes are the most interesting. You have the women's stories that are as well crafted or not well crafted as the men's and so forth. Like the fans seem to, especially the male fans in particular, seem to be more into a lot of the women's action than they are the men's action nowadays. 20 years ago, when you had these legit talents like Trish and Molly, the fans largely sat on their hands and didn't really care much. It's crazy to me. Now, mind you, I was just watching this the whole time looking at Trish in her purple suit. And I thought, fuck, these are just two sexy women. And I know some of you are saying, well, you don't do white girls. You're right, I don't. But I would certainly make two exceptions in their cases, okay? Like, it's okay to branch out a little bit. It's okay to branch out. 2002 was so good from a talent standpoint that Kurt Angle and Hulk Hogan were wrestling basically mid-card in a grudge match type of thing. Not for a title, not for anything else. Like you had Hulk, Hulk Hogan mid-carding. And this is about the right place on the card. It didn't belong in the main event. Like it was third from last. And it was the right place. And this was a decent match. Like for everything you could say about Hulk Hogan and the person that he is, that's fair and valid. When you talk about him... You know, a lot of people will talk about the politicking and the whining and the bitching and everything else. And Hulkster does business the Hulkster's way. He went out there and tapped out to Kurt Angle in the ankle lock. You say whatever the hell you want about him. But all these things that people want to talk about, like especially the ones that always frustrate me, is him compared to Austin. Now, Austin seems to always have ex escaped this, you know, he's not a politicker. Austin was a big fucking backstage politicker. Are you kidding me? He was worse than Hogan. Because at least you could point to significant moments in time in WWF history, WWE history, WCW history, that Hogan would do the job and put somebody over. Luger, Sting, Warrior. Like, 
Sometimes yes, by hook or by crook, but fucking Yokozuna, like, the point is, Hulkster would occasionally do some business. And he did it here. They didn't have to have him tap out. They could have probably went without it since Hulk had just recently been the WWE Undisputed Champion. But, you know what? They went there. It worked out to be a decent match. The King of the Ring final was Brock Lesnar versus RVD. It was pretty short, but it got the point across. Like, Brock's your dude. Brock's going to be your next big thing. Brock's going to get the Undisputed Championship match at SummerSlam. And then it feeds into the main event of the show of who's going to be the champion that he ultimately faces at SummerSlam. And it's Taker versus Triple H for the Undisputed Championship. It was really kind of weird at this point how Rock was kind of shoehorned into the show. Like, the backstage segment with him and Booker and Goldust was fucking comedy gold. God, that was fantastic. But it was just kind of weird how The Rock was shoehorned in here. And you got Taker and Triple H are fighting for the Undisputed Championship. But you got Rock coming out on commentary. You know, Taker getting into Rock's face and hitting him. And then Rock hitting back. Like, this, this title match admittedly was a bit of a mess. A bit of an overbooked mess. And, you know, I guess you got the fucking rock. So, I mean, you got to use him somehow. But it was weird. It was, it was really weird. And it, it just, like at the end of it, you know, after Taker's beating Triple H, Rock's walk leaving and then him and Taker jawing back and forth. Rock's on the ramp, Taker's in the ring, and then Rock comes down. And then after he takes out Taker, then Triple H takes out Rock. It's just like, um, yeah, no, I'm good. Uh, <laughs> but damn, like, the energy was still pretty palpable. Um, and the star power certainly was on this show. But when I look at this card from top to bottom, even though I'm not the biggest fan of the main event, I'm not the biggest fan of this championship match, and it was just an excuse for them to insert Rock so that way they could put the belt on Rock so that way they could put the maximum star power they could against Brock at SummerSlam when they did the job for Brock. Um, you know, this was a really good show. And at least I can say, as you sort through some of the other King of the Ring shows over the years, they were kind of, ugh. This was yet another good show in 2002. Like, Mania was solid that year. SummerSlam was pretty good that year. Survivor Series is great that year. Like... He had a number of really good pay-per-views in 2002, and King of the Rings certainly belongs in that echelon because this was some good stuff to go back and watch. You see kind of the emergence of Brock Lesnar. You know, you get to see Ric Flair and Eddie Guerrero wrestle each other. You got Molly Holly and Trish Stratus. You got Angle against Hogan, and Hogan's freaking tapping out to the ankle lock. RVD and Jericho and their hellified good opening um, King of the Rings semifinal match, like... This show had a lot. And Jamie Noble and Nidia and the Hurricane, man. Like, this is a lot of fun of a show to go back and watch again. So, if you go back and watch any King of the Rings show from beginning to end, obviously you got to do 98 because of Taker and Mankind. But the other one, it's got to be this year, 2002, because this show was fantastic.